Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behaviour nerds. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Nancy Tucker. Nancy is a certified trainer with the CCPDT and a fully certified behaviour consultant with the IAABC. Nancy teaches seminars, webinars and workshops on dog training, dog behaviour and the business end of training throughout Canada, the US and Europe. Nancy has presented at conferences for the PPG, the Pet Professional Guild, the IAABC, the Dog Event in France and the Wolf Conference in the UK. She's also an instructor for Fenzie Dog Sports Academy, where she teaches popular courses focusing on various topics, including how to treat separation and anxiety, how to use desensitization and counter conditioning to treat fearful behaviors, and how to tackle other common behavior issues like overzealous greetings. Nancy has written numerous articles on dog behavior and is a regular contributor to the Whole Dog Journal. She shares her home in Quebec, Canada, with her husband Tom and their border terrier. Bennigan. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Nancy Tucker to the show today who's patiently waiting. Bye. Nancy, hello. How are you doing? Hello, Ryan. Doing very well. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you for making time to come on the Animal Training Academy podcast show. We're thrilled to have you here with us. I am super happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's <laughs> dive straight into the first question today, Nancy. Could you please take everyone listening, back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share some stories from some of the first animals you trained. Sure. Um, Actually, my discovery of positive reinforcement training started pretty late in life. I've I've had dogs my entire life and it wasn't until um, close to 15 years ago when I adopted a dog here at the from the local shelter who had behavior issues that couldn't be handled sort of the the simple way that that we would um, typically use training or training as I knew it to to uh, you know shape behaviors with our family dogs. This dog had a serious issue with separation anxiety. Um, there were some uh, mild aggression issues uh, with other dogs. But l- let me take you even further back from before that day, how that all started. My career before dogs was in public relations, and I used to also work uh, as a, as a writer doing public relations type writing, speech writing, things like that. And um, I used to do a lot of work in customer service, training customer service reps. Um, and I thought, in my wisdom, that I could use some of my public relations expertise to help the local shelter. Um, and I wanted to approach them to see if I could offer my services, you know, instead of making a, a monetary donation, is there something that I can do to help the organization? Um, I think it was very presumptuous of me to think that I could do that when you don't know anything about um, operating a shelter. I just thought, you know, sometimes you, you put on a cape and you think that you can save the world. So 
when I approached the shelter, that's when I realized um, through talking with people who worked there that most of the dogs that were there were there because of behavior issues. You know, they had been surrendered by their family because of behavior issues. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Maybe there's something that, that I can do to get involved to help with that as well. So I started learning about dog training and I started learning the really simple stuff, um, you know, the, the very basic training cues that most of us learn to sit down, uh, recall, you know, very, very simple stuff. And once I had learned how to do that, um, through positive reinforcement, then of course I, I felt I was an expert and thought that I could, uh, save the world and save all the dogs and shelters with this basic type of training. Um, and that's when I learned that, you know, life wasn't quite so simple for these dogs when I adopted this dog from that shelter and discovered that there's a lot more here that I don't know how to handle. Um, so that's when I started to get really interested, um, because I needed to in, um, behavior in, not so much, I, I wouldn't say so much animal behavior. I was really super focused on dogs only. Um, and I started to learn more and more about dog cognition and how they learned and how to deal with some of these more serious behavior issues. And that, of course, took me on a journey that continues today. Um, but during that time, you know, and it wasn't that long ago, it was just 12 years ago, but during that time, resources, especially here, you know, I, I'm, I live in a primarily French speaking community and resources were really, really slim. It was very hard to find information about dog behavior and about dog training. Um, and lucky for me, of course, I, I, I speak fluent English. So I was, I, you know, I had access to, to a lot of um, other resources that people here don't. So that's where I thought I could help my community by going to get this information in the English speaking community and um, sharing that with my French speaking community. And that's when I, started to get involved in professionally offering services for dog training. Um, and I didn't get into dog behavior consulting until later when I had the confidence that I could, um, that I could help people with problems like um, aggression or separation anxiety. So that's it in a nutshell. I think we might call the episode today, you put on a cape and you think you can save the world. <laughs> yeah, all the right intentions, yeah. <laughs> Hey, <clears throat> so you, you thought your experience in public relations uh, could assist in the shelter world before you kind of jumped in there and, and, and learned uh, other ways you could assist. Uh, I'm always really fascinated by where people came from and what their experience was before getting into dogs. So I'm curious to know, what have you brought from public relations uh, into your work now that kind of gives you, um, I'm thinking in marketing terms here, I was going to say an unfair advantage, but that's not what I mean. Like what, uh, you know, how does it help you be more efficient now? Do you think that, that other people who haven't got that experience might, uh, not? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in public relations is all about perception. It's, it's not always, um, necessarily a means to share the correct information. Um, and this will make sense in a minute. Um, it's mostly to do with how the information is received. So, and I think that this is really relevant, especially in our positive reinforcement community, because um, sometimes we tend to come on a little strong, <laughs> uh, especially if we're trying to communicate with people who aren't there yet, you know, who aren't quite convinced yet about uh, the use of positive reinforcement, um, people who might still be, um, you know, more influenced by, say, more traditional training methods or, or what today is being called balanced training methods. And I think that um, although I came on a little strong in the beginning, and I know that I did, I think that after that, when I was able to kind of marry my experience in public relations and training, I was able to realize that I could be far more effective if I took care to um, consider how my information was received rather than just trying to shove information down somebody's throat. Um, so I think that that's where my experience um in public relations, especially in writing and in, in communicating through writing, which is my forte far more than communicating in person is communicating in writing. Um, I think that that's where my skills have come in super handy. And so I guess we're going to talk about some of this stuff in later parts of the podcast today about how to uh, give people information. What is, what, is, what is coming on too strongly? I ask this because... <laughs> <laughs> I ask this. I, I, I ask this because in, in on Facebook and working uh, with the, the wonderful members of the Animal Training Academy, uh, you know this communication 
with others who might share different views with us with regards to uh, how we interact with our animals' behaviour uh, is one that comes up on a weekly basis. We're having people want to know how to engage efficiently uh, in in that space. Um, so what, firstly, what does coming on too strongly look like for <laughs> you? <laughs> well, coming on too strongly is you're wrong, I'm right. So listen to me. That's coming on far too strongly, obviously. But when you're when you feel really passionate about something, um, whether you're right or wrong, when you feel really passionate about something, you tend to come on. When I say you, of course, I don't mean you, <laughs> although I don't know that for true. But we tend to come on a little strongly because it's coming from a place of passion, um, and because it's coming from focusing on us our needs and being understood rather than seeking to understand and listening and um, hearing what the other person needs. So whether that is dealing with a client or dealing with a colleague or dealing with just anybody else, hearing what they need is going to influence how you share that information. You know, what do they need from you before you decide what type of information you're going to share and how you're going to share it? Which is what we do with our animals. It is, isn't it? And we have such a hard time doing it with people. Isn't, Determin- that, isn't that weird? Yeah. Determining the function. And I, I kind of feel like the function in those conversations isn't necessarily, or it quickly changes from being right or uh, having having all of the facts and knowing what the science says about positive reinforcement training to being right and wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. And defending that. Y- yeah. And, and not just defending it, but really focusing on making the other person say, you're right. I've been wrong all along. You're right. It's not just defending it, but it's it's really, really wanting the other person to change their mind about something, which is odd because we, we know that, you know, training through compulsion is something that that we avoid through positive reinforcement when we work through positive uh, reinforcement. Um, and yet it, it's compulsion is the thing that we tend to jump to when we're dealing with humans especially those that don't agree with us. And I feel like we're going to be talking about this later as well. We're going to be talking about uh, the need to split up your behavior change programs. Uh, And so once again, with animals, we do it, but but potentially with people, we want that final behavior now (laughs) rather than what is is celebrating the approximation. Anyway, let's um, (laughs) let's get out of this rabbit hole. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think that every Facebook discussion should eventually end exactly with those words. <laughs> Let's get out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> or should it? <laughs> Interesting. I'm going, to try, I'm going to try that for a week. I'm going to end every Facebook conversation with that. <laughs> See how <it> goes. <laughs> yes. All right. So then you, you got your dog from the shelter. You learned that the dogs were there because of the majority of dogs were there because of behavioral challenges. Uh, you came in wearing your cape to change the world. You you learned more about shelters and, and potentially change your tact. Uh, and then you took a while, you said, to develop your confidence. Um, and, you know, I, I should I should add here that um, when I removed my cape and realized that, that I couldn't save the world, that there were people in that environment that knew far more than I did, um, I volunteered uh, to be an assistant in, in the shelter's group training classes. Um, so I learned a lot through that, and I became friends with the head trainer there, who is a dear friend today, and I learned a lot from her until I, you know, eventually became uh, an instructor for their school and then eventually opened up my own school. Um, but I don't remember your question. What was your question? I don't know. We'll get out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I don't remember my question either. Oh, yeah, you, you developed, uh, you took you a while to develop your confidence. Oh, right. My confidence in terms of dealing with the more serious issues where I knew I didn't have the skills um, to handle aggression cases and to handle um, cases that dealt with fear or anxiety. Um, I think that, I think, I think that I've always at the time recognized that I lacked those skills and that I shouldn't attempt them because I lacked those skills. And when I say I think, it's like now I'm thinking, was I afraid to take them or did I recognize I didn't have the skills? And I don't know if those two are mutually exclusive, but, um, uh, but sometimes, you know, I see maybe more novice trainers um, taking on cases that are super heavy and super involved. Um, and sometimes they have the confidence to do it, but maybe not the skills, which I think could, could be a little bit dangerous. And sometimes um, 
sometimes they do have the skills, but they lack the confidence. Mm. Standing in front of that rabbit hole, but let's, <laughs> let's push on because I'm, I'm curious to know more, but I know the, the middle of this episode is so meaty today, so I'm, I'm also eager to uh, race ahead to that part. So before we do that, do you want to just uh, tell the audience what you're up to now? We kind of said it in your bio, but just give a recap and, and where people can go to uh, find you online or if they're in Quebec. <laughs> yep. Where they can uh, it, it, can you say Quebec again? I think that it's... <laughs> Quebec, mate. <laughs> Quebec. <laughs> That's Aussie. I don't know why I decided I was Australian all of a sudden because I'm not. <laughs> See, I wouldn't have recognized that that was an... <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, right. How, how to find me? Well, I, I do have a website, nancytucker.com, and um, most of my work now is... Uh, primarily focused on other trainers. I do a lot of work with other trainers, helping other trainers. Um, even my work through uh, the Fenzy Dog Sports Academy, the classes that I do there, uh, I think that although many of them are pet dog owners, the people that take my classes, there are also trainers who take my classes um, to learn maybe some new skills or to uh, even if they already are skilled in in um, solving some of the issues that I address in my classes. Sometimes it's, it's good to just listen to uh, to what other instructors are doing, you know, pick up little nuggets or, or to see things from a different point of view. Um, uh, I'm sorry, where was I going with this? <laughs> oh, what was I working on these days? Yes. <laughs> just, just pointing people to where they can go to to uh, connect with you. And we'll make sure we link to all of us in the podcast write-up as well on the ADA website. Right. So uh, just quickly uh, to recap a little bit, because I, I, I think what I'm doing is <laughs> as I'm navigating these rabbit holes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stay on course. So my website is nancytucker.com. And what I'm working on currently is um, the book, the Good Enough Dog Book for Trainers. Which, uh, we'll be talking about a, a couple of the uh, concepts that I discuss in the book here today. And um, and the services that I offer, of course, are, are can be seen on my site. But um, my focus, again, is helping trainers through either some tough behavior cases or um, tough client situations um, because of my experience with uh, customer service and with public relations and with writing services. I, I do a lot of writing for clients as well, trainers. Cool. So, and, and that's all, all your links to Fenzy and Dog Eye Box and everything's on your nancytucker.com right. website, yes. isn't it? Yes. Awesome. So we'll link to that in the show notes for everyone or you can type that into your url bar hey thanks so much for sharing everything so far nancy we call this people's behavior odysseys so we appreciate hearing about yours moving forward i'd really like to talk as you mentioned there about the subject under the umbrella of the good enough dog uh, and this is making sure your client and their dogs are happy when you leave can you talk to this and i believe you've put together five tips for the listeners of this show about how they can achieve this yes yeah uh you know the the good enough dog concept came about when i was asking myself are we expecting too much from our clients and are we expecting too much from our dogs um it, it just um was an idea that formed in my head several years ago, and I started discussing it with uh, with other dog trainers, and it grew into um, how I now approach the work that I do with clients and how I approach um, any sort of consulting that I do with trainers as well who have questions about their own clients. Um, so if I was to, uh, not summarize, but if I was to uh, pluck five points from that concept to talk about today, I think that the first one that I would talk about um, is the importance of listening to your client. And that one stems from my experience uh, working in customer service and being able to um, listen, to I mean, really listen and listen between the lines, so to speak, uh, to what a client is telling me and what a customer is telling me in order to meet their needs. Um, and I think what happens with a lot of us as trainers, especially if we've got a lot of experience and we're used to meeting a, a behavior issue with a, kind of a preconceived idea in our head of how we're going to address this. And, and I know that with behavior analysis, you know, it's, 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 it's the study of one and, and we, uh, we know that we should, um, 
you know, look at the, the one dog in front of us and, and tailor our solution according to that dog. But uh, like it or not, we do have these preconceived ideas and we have these kind of protocols filed way in, in our brain um, so that if I'm going to meet a client about a specific problem, I already sort of know how I intend to deal with that issue. Um, and that can really, I think, um, blur our communication with the client. I think that we um, tend to maybe rush through the the intake process and the discussion with our client just to kind of hurry up and get to the solution without really listening to who it is that we're dealing with. Um, and a lot of our solutions might not fit that person's lifestyle as well as we would hope. And I think that um, if we really listen to them, they will tell us what it is that they need. And our solution should match that rather than trying to get them to match our solution. Um, you know, when we talk about client compliance, um, I think that I prefer the term co client cooperation or client collaboration um, because we really need to listen to what they need. And it's our job to tailor our solution according to their needs. That's the first point. Uh, the second point that I think I would like to um, to share is that I don't think that we should be afraid to use management solutions, when, especially when we first meet with the client. And I call those, um, I'm not the only one who calls them that, but what we refer to as band-aid solutions that tend to have a negative connotation when people think of a band-aid solution and they think, well, that's not a real solution. You're not actually fixing anything. You're just putting a band-aid over it. And I think that um, as trainers, we're almost shamed into not relying on band-aid solutions because you know, we're told management always fails. And I think, well, management doesn't always fail. And even if it does fail, it's not the end of the world, you know? Um, and, and I think of, as an example of, of a, of a band-aid solution, um, I like to point at my eyeglasses when I'm talking with somebody to say, well, this is a band-aid solution. You know, the, the eyeglasses don't actually correct my vision permanently. If I take off my glasses, I can't see. So it is a band-aid solution. If I break them or if I lose them, it's not the end of the world. I can get another pair of glasses. So if, if management, which is, which is all this is, I'm, I'm managing my eyesight with these eyeglasses, um, and if that fails, well, that's okay. I get another pair of glasses and off we go. So that sometimes we can present uh, a Band-Aid solution with a client to a client. Um, and even though it doesn't permanently fix their problem, it could be a permanent Band-Aid solution. Um, and, a, and a good example of that is um, using um, that, oh, what's it called in English? The static film that you can put on windows, the frosted static film. If a client calls me with an issue uh, with a, a barking dog and I walk into their home and I offer them the Band-Aid solution of sticking the, the, um, the film, the frosted film on the window, I'm not affecting their dog's behavior in a sense, of, in a traditional sense of training and teaching the dog um, how to respond differently to stimuli that they see outside the window. I'm not using uh, desensitization. I'm not using counter conditioning. I'm not training any new behaviors, but I am affecting their behavior immediately and permanently by sticking this frosted decal on the window <laughs> that prevents them from, uh, from even seeing the stimulus that had them uh, barking in the first place. So that is a band-aid solution that we can offer to a client that could last potentially forever. <laughs> Um, and it's a quick solution and it meets the client's needs. So if I'm, if I'm meeting with a client and, you know, after speaking with them for a few minutes, I can tell that they are either unlikely or unable to go through with a, a training program or a behavior modification program that, uh, that could take, uh, that could take a lot of time and that could require a lot of skill. Then I think that it, it's my responsibility as a behavior consultant to offer them, um, the easiest and quickest solution that will make both their dog and them happy. Um, and that brings me to my third point, which is, and I, and I call it putting out the fire. Um, I think that when people contact us with an issue, usually it's because something's come to a boiling point. You know, something uh, has now become an emergency for them um, for whatever reason. You know, the problem could have existed for a very, very long time, but for whatever reason, they've contacted us now and they consider it now to be a problem that they need to deal with and usually immediately. <laughs> 
Um, you know, and we've all we've all had those uh, those clients who who need the problem solved by the weekend, um, when really we know that it could be something that could take months to to change. Um, but what I mean by putting out the fire is that sometimes when they call us and they're in that state um, and they've been dealing with a problem behavior with their dog and they've gotten to a point where they might not even like their dog very much anymore. You know, when you're really angry with somebody and and you know, no matter what your relationship is with that person, when when you're experiencing a lot of frustration, uh, when you're experiencing a lot of stress, um, especially as a result of that person or that dog's behavior, you don't like them very much at that moment. Um, and all the mediation in the world and all the training in the world isn't going to change that until you, you can get a break, until you can get some sort of reprieve from the issue in order to be able to just kind of cool down and begin to like your dog again or like the person again. And I think that many of us can relate to that. So our job, if I'm walking into this home, back to this barking example, if I'm walking into this home and this person is just... Um, at their wit's end with their dogs barking, I think that if I can put out the fire with an immediate solution that at least gives them a chance to calm down and to repair the relationship with their dog again, then maybe later, you know, once I've given them some time to cool down and um, and calm things down in, in their home, then maybe later they'll be in, in a calmer state of mind and more open to hearing what I have to say if they want to engage in a, in a training or a behavior modification program. And that might not even be necessary necessary. You know, they might be completely happy with this quickie solution that I've given them and that, um, and that they don't feel that they need any more training. Everything's fine. Um, and I think that, uh, some trainers might be receiving this information thinking, well, wait a minute now, she's talking about me losing, you know, six weeks weeks worth of income here because now this person no longer needs my training. I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot by doing these, these quickie solutions. But if you think of it now from a PR sp- perspective, um, and this person is now talking with their family and their friends and their coworkers, you know, and they're at work one day and one of their coworkers says, didn't you just hire a trainer? I need a trainer. I've got a problem with my dog. Didn't you just hire one? What was this person's name? And would you recommend them? And their answer could be one of two things. You know, if you have solved this immediate solution, I mean, this immediate problem for them, even though it only took one, um, one meeting with them, they will likely speak very highly of you and they will likely hurry up to give your name to this person and say, oh my God, call her. You know, she, she solved this problem for me in 20 minutes. It was super easy. I loved it. Or if you walked into that home and you uh, presented them with this elaborate training plan that you knew would solve the problem through desensitization and counter conditioning and, and training different behaviors, um, it's very possible that they were overwhelmed by that and either didn't do it, uh, you know, wouldn't go through with the program and wouldn't train their dog and either the dog, you know, might lose their home because of it or the problem persists and you haven't done anything so that when somebody asks them about the services that you offered and they say, oh yeah, no, don't don't bother calling her. You know, she came over once and it never solved my problem. Um, here, call this other guy. So from, from a, a PR perspective, offering these quickie solutions, at least to just put out the fire and offer them some reprieve. Um, chances are later on when things are cooler, you've got, you've got a better opportunity now to, to offer them services that they will probably be more open to um, because they're, they're feeling a bit happier about their situation. Um, and then which brings me to my fourth point. Uh, when we were talking earlier about uh, splitting um, tasks when we're teaching dogs, the same can be said about teaching people. You know, we've, we've got to give them some easier steps to do rather than jumping right into presenting them with uh, you know a six month plan for training and behavior modification. That's to us, you know, as trainers and behavior consultants. We love this stuff. <laughs> we just, we eat this stuff for lunch. We, we, we love to look at, at a problem and, and put it together like a puzzle. And, and it doesn't matter how long, um, uh, how long it might take to, to address a behavior, uh, a behavior issue, but to, you know, a, a pet, the pet owning public, these types of plans can be really, really intimidating. So I think that we should avoid overwhelming them with jargon, um, overwhelming them with scientific explanations. You know, I call it putting on our explainy pants when we're when we're spe- speaking with uh, with clients. I think that 
if we just give them a first step, if we just give them something simple to do, um, and, and again, it's either going to be a, a management solution, a band-aid solution, just give them something simple that they can succeed at, and then give them some time to digest it, and then come back to them. So when I say come back to them, I mean, don't present everything in your first meeting, not because you want to hold back and you want them to be hungry for information as a way to, to, to uh, keep your income going, that you're, you're going to want them coming back to you. I mean it in a sense that you don't want to overwhelm them. So you just give them a little bit to digest at a time, give them some time to think about it, to work on it, to experience some success, and then go back to them a few days later or a week later or however long you, you think is, is appropriate for this client, and then offer them the next step. Um, and ask them how they're doing. Ask them if they're okay with things, with how things are going at that time, because it might be okay. You know, they they might actually have had enough of uh, of a solution to to solve the problem as they see it, and they're perfectly happy. And if they're perfectly happy, you don't need to continue. <laughs> Go on to the next person who needs your help. We don't have to solve a problem 100% according to our definition of how a problem, um, when a problem is solved, we don't get to decide that. The client decides when the problem is solved. We don't get to, to decide that no matter how much we would want to continue. <laughs> you know, if we think that, uh, you know, I, and I've had these situations where clients think, no, everything's fine. We're good now. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, you, there is so much more that needs to be done here. This is not good, <laughs> but the dog's happy and the client's happy. We need to be able to just step back and, and, and let them live their life happily with their dog. Um, and I think that the, the, uh, the last point, and, and this is, this is one that, that I talk about a lot and that gets some criticism um, and that is that if it's not a problem for you, it's not a problem. And that means, um, if we see a behavior as trainers that we think should be addressed, for example, if somebody likes to sit at the kitchen table and their dog has got their paws up on the table and they're sharing their lunch with their dog and they're happy and the dog is happy. And for them, that's not a problem, but we see it as a potential problem. It's not up to us to decide whether or not it's a problem. That's one aspect of it. I like to share this idea with clients as well, that if it's not a problem for them, it's not a problem. Because I think a lot of people feel pressure in um, addressing their dog's behavior, uh, either social pressure, um, and most commonly actually social pressure. For example, if somebody is walking with their dog and their dog likes to zigzag in front of them and, and you know take in all the smells that they can, I don't see a problem with that. And it's possible that the client doesn't see a problem with that at all, but they've been told by neighbors, by family members, by coworkers, oh, you shouldn't let your dog walk like that. You know, your dog needs to be behind you or next to you and don't let them sniff the ground and you know so as behavior consultants if we can when we meet with them when when we're listening to them that first point when we're finding out what their needs are I think it's important to ask them why they think that they need to change this behavior because it's entirely possible that it's because of social pressure or because they're comparing their dog to another dog um, either a, a dog that they used to have or or a dog that they see across the street who likes to sit on the porch and never leaves the property but their own dog runs off the property all the time. Why can't my dog be like the other dog across the street who sits on the porch without running off? Um, so we need to ask them why they think it's a problem and to help them uh, determine whether or not they even need to address it according to what their needs are, what their expectations are, um, and to let them know what is normal or not normal dog behavior. I think lots of times people think that there's a problem, but it's actually normal dog behavior. And when you tell them that, often they feel okay with that. They're like, oh, oh, you mean it's okay if you know it's normal for him to want to dig. It's not actually a, a weird behavior for my dog. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. Makes sense to me. So let's go through them all again just quickly. Number one is the importance of listening to your clients. Number two is I don't think we should be afraid to use management suggestions. <laughs> I'm reading what I wrote down, but I can read that so much better. <laughs> the Band-Aid solutions. Yeah. Don't be afraid to use Band-Aid solutions. Uh, number three is uh, think about just putting out the fire. Yep. As opposed to coming in with a big behavior give change some, uh, plan. Some reprieve. Yeah, give them a time, give them give them uh, some time to cool down before you address any sort of behavior modification. Uh, number four is when we teach people, we have to give them some easier steps to do. So be a splitter, not a lumper. Yes, yes. Uh, 
and then and leave them be. Let them digest that before you go on to the next step. Uh-huh. And then number five is uh, if it's not a problem for them, then it's not a problem for you. Yeah. Find out why they want to address the problem. So let, let's just go through them all again. And then I'm, I'm, I'm curious to tease out as well for the listeners of this show that are working with clients, which is a significant chunk. Um, and maybe it's not people necessarily working with clients. Maybe we have people working in organizations that have to train new staff members, et cetera. Um, you, you said you're, for the first one, the importance of listening to your clients, your public relations background kind of came in to help you here. The the, um, the uh, customer service experience mostly came into mm. came in handy here. So I remember when I was young and I was working in a department store, and this lady brought back this this uh, I don't know what you call them in Quebec. <laughs> we call them duvets in New Zealand, like a bed blanket that you put a cover on. Duvet, yeah. Duvet, it, cool. You know, you know, it's a French word, right? <laughs> oh no, I, no <laughs> yes, I knew that. Um, <laughs> And and it was clearly from another store. Like it, it had the other store's packaging on it. Yeah. And she's like, no, I brought it here. And we're like, well. And then our manager came out and said, oh, yeah, of course, no worries. We'll give you a refund for that. And he gave her a refund. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> but like yeah. his motto was the customer's always right. Like she's going to go away. She's going to tell people about it, blah, blah, blah. Is, is, that, is, the, is the customer always right? Is that what you're saying there? When Well, like the customer go- is always right. Absolutely. Mm. How, yeah. how, how do dog trainers get their mind around that? <laughs> They're like, well, no, they're not. They're not. That's, but, that dude is not from this store. <laughs> and, and and you're right. So yeah, actually, what you've just you know you've just um, paired customer service skills with public relations there because the customer service skills is listening to the person. And if you see that they're super irate about this, you know, and yeah, I absolutely learned this training tip from you. I'm convinced that you're the one who told me to do this, and you know, I would never have said that. But um, but you see that they're adamant and they're irate. So engaging into in an argument with them is not going to get you anywhere, you know. So um, and, and that's the customer service part is, is is learning how to listen and how to diffuse situations. The public relations comes in when you know that the person is going to leave this interaction with you, and they're either going to leave saying, "Hi, oh, that guy Ryan, oh, he's fantastic," you know. I was in there for three minutes and he gave me a refund for this duvet. That's all that counts is that this is what they're going to tell other people. So the public relations aspect of it is the public perception of you and your service and your business. Um, so if, you know, if you're able to at least help the client feel like they've been listened to and that their problem has been solved, um, even if, you know, let's say, let's talk about refunds. Let's say that you're offering group classes and you've given the person a deadline, you know, if you don't, or if you've sold, a, 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 if you do packages, um, behavior consultation packages, and you tell the person if you don't use it, within six months, it's no longer valid. But on the seventh month, the person calls you and they're, and you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, that ran out a month ago. And I emailed you and I called you and, and they're becoming very irate. And they're like, what? You're ripping me off. And um, you have to think about that. Do you want to be right at that moment? You know, is it important to you to say, no, I, I'm just not doing it and hang up and have this person now going off on your business and talking badly about you? And, or is it worth just sort of biting the bullet and saying, you know, this is highly unusual and I never do this, but okay, I'll tell you what, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's come to some sort of compromise and maybe give them another session or, um, and you could be salvaging it, or you, you could decide you don't want this person as a client and throw them a bone and refund them, just refund them. So that at least they're, you know, you don't have to deal with them anymore, but you've done something towards, um, salvaging your image. So yes, the customer is absolutely always right. Even when they're terribly, terribly wrong. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I was 17 when that lady brought that uh, duvet in, um, which is a French word, did you know? And, <laughs> and it stuck with me. And, and, and now anyone that has any issues, I just do what they ask. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. And it's, and it's cool. I didn't really think about that, how it's influencing me now. So we're actually, uh, would, you, would, uh, would you agree with my thought process here that we're actually able to help more dogs uh, by having people live happy even if they're not doing what we want? Yes, exactly. Even if we haven't, even if as trainers, we haven't trained the dog, you know, if all I did was stick window film on my client's windows, help them out that afternoon. Even if I, you know, if I brought the stuff in with me and my training session consisted of my installing this stuff on the person's window, um, you know, I'm still doing my job and my job in my view, my job is making sure that the dog's 
the, the dog's um, position in that home is not in jeopardy. Um, you know, he's not at risk of being surrendered because of his behavior issues. That's my job. That's how I see my job as, as a trainer. Um, and because I've put out that fire, then this person is probably going to speak highly of me so that I may help other dogs. Um, or they might call me later on, you know, another issue will come up and they'll say, hey, I remember I had such a great experience with you. Here's my new issue. How should I handle this? Um, so you may have a lifelong client with you or they get another puppy years later or, you know, it's all part of um, making sure that you solve the person's problem, whether you're training or not. And I guess I should I, I should um, point out here that I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm just sort of pushing solutions that don't involve training, you know, get in and get out. Um, that's not at all what I'm trying to say. There will be times where you absolutely have to have those training skills. So this is not an excuse to um, to not keep learning and to not hone your own skills as a trainer and behavior consultant. You absolutely need to know what you're doing, but you don't always have to use it is what I was getting at. And so we show up to our client's house with their barking at the window dog uh, and their client's saying, I don't have time for anything, just I need this dealt with. Um, but we've got our preconceived, we're going there with our preconceived ideas of what we're going to do. Uh, before we move on to number two, can you offer some tips? How do we how do we frame ourselves then before we walk into that client's house? How do we mentally prepare ourselves to remove potentially remove some of our preconceived ideas about what we're about to go do? Mm-hmm. And that's oh, that is probably one of the hardest things to learn to do for anybody in any line of work. I would say, <laughs> you know, we all we all have our biases. We all have uh, our own sort of cognitive dissonance situations to to deal with all the time. So I think that if you go in there prepared to listen and that, um, uh, you know, sort of what you're doing here, you know, after I'm done speaking and you sort of recap what it is that I've said, um, I know that you're, you're doing it for the purposes of the listeners, but if you are dealing with a client and you've listened to them and you've taken notes, it's great to sort of reiterate to them, you know, recap what they've said, uh, make sure that you're, that you're on the same page. And I think that if you go in with that mindset, with really listening to them so that you're able to reiterate back to them what it is that they just said, you'll be able to focus on what they're saying rather than thinking ahead at how you're going to solve this problem for them. If you really, really are focusing on what they're saying and you're able to reiterate it back to them, um, then I think that um, you'll be able to avoid then um, uh, kind of settling on your preconceived ideas of how you're going to handle this. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to <laughs> – sometimes I've wanted to do that and I've said, hey, let me just repeat back to you what you've said just to make sure I've understood. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> my mind's going – my mind's like jumping ahead about what I want to say and express what they're actually saying to me. So you heard it here first uh, to quote Nancy Tucker. If you want to be good or, better at this, good or, I was about to say gooder at this, then uh, just be more like Ryan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Be more uh, like Ryan. Uh, so number two was I don't think well, you said we, you don't think we should be afraid to use band aid solutions. So you know when you, when you're suggesting this to people, what kind of um, criticisms have you found about that tip? Why are people so against? Are people so against using band aid solutions? Um, and I think when when I say that I've received criticism, I think it's uh, what I'm talking about is from other trainers. Um, uh, which brings me to another point, you know, as trainers, we're often just so concerned about what other trainers think <laughs> about what we're doing and how we're approaching things. And really, uh, the only person whose opinion counts is your client. So I think that uh, part of kind of maturing in this industry um, for me has been to stop worrying about what other trainers think about how I work and, and what it is that I say and what it is that I do. And that's really, really hard because we are a tight-knit community um, of trainers and and we are extremely critical of each other, which is bizarre. And I, and I think that's kind of changing. There is a, there is a shift, I think, in, in our training culture where we're starting to um, uh, deal with each other with more respect and kindness and compassion, which is, is fantastic. Um, but you see, I've wandered off again from your question. What, what was it that you asked? <laughs> what, well, you're answering it. Well, why people are against the band-aid solutions. So one thing oh, you're right. saying is because they think they might be judged by others. 
Uh, well, no, it's just that we've, I think that we've, we've hammered home the idea that uh, a Band-Aid solution is somehow flimsy. It's something that, um, that only somebody who doesn't know what they're doing would do. They would just put a Band-Aid over it rather than really solve the issue, either because they can't or they don't know how. Um, and we're, we're always told, that, you know, th- this, this phrase, management always fails. And, and I say, until it doesn't. <laughs> or... If it does, it's not the end of the world. You know, most of the time, management um, is an excellent solution. And, and I, I should add here, though, that when I talk about Band-Aid solutions and, and, and using management, most of the time I'm talking about garden variety behavior issues. I think that, uh, you know, when I, when I talk about if it's not a problem for you, it's not a problem. Well, I don't think that this is necessarily true when we're talking about aggression issues or um, situations where the dog is experiencing fear and anxiety. Um, that is a problem for the dog and aggression is, well, a problem, uh, it could be a safety issue for others. So uh, that is not those situations where we're dealing with aggression or anxiety. Um, th- those are not situations that can that, or should be easily handled with management. And uh, you can't ignore it if it's not a problem for you. You know, if your dog is attacking visitors, but it's not a problem for you. It's a problem for the visitors. It's a safety issue. So, yeah, that's a problem. All right, cool. Number, number three is uh, go in uh, and put out the fire. Uh, fix fix the person's problem. So you mentioned in that uh, segment that uh, you're, or, or you mentioned earlier as well, you're, you're currently writing The Good Enough Dog. Uh, and and so this is this is the idea of just The Good Enough Dog, is it? Like the if you put out the fire, the client cools down a little bit, the dog does behaviours that uh, agree with the client and the dog stays in the person's home. Uh, is, that, is that this, am I kind of understanding the title, The Good Enough Dog, and how it relates to this point here? Uh, yeah, I think that well, The Good Enough Dog, the title came from... Um, considering how maybe our expectations might sometimes be a little bit too high with regards to our dog's behavior and with regards to our, our clients' behaviors um, and, and what our clients are capable and willing to do. So that sometimes good enough is good enough. <laughs> um, but putting out the fire... I. What I'm getting at there is that uh, sometimes when we walk in for a very initial consultation with with a client, we tend to throw too much into that first consultation. And rather than behaving like a first responder who's going to put out the fire, we walk in there with a full package solution and we inundate them with information and um, uh, information that can be extremely overwhelming to a point where they're they're no longer interested in in maybe in their dog period, because ugh, to fix this problem, and you're telling me now it's going to take six months and, and I'm going to have to do what and give up what? Um, so I think that by saying putting out the fire, if we can just go in there and calm things down, at least give them a solution that will at least temporarily calm things down long enough for them to breathe again and not have to live with the stress of whatever problem they're dealing with. Um, uh, for example, if if problem is... Um, they can't walk down the street with their dog without their dog spinning in circles and lunging at everything. You know, if we walk in there and we tell them, okay, here's what we need to do to fix the problem. Instead of starting out with that, let's put out the fire by telling them, you know what, let's just not walk with the dog for a week. Why, why don't we do that? <laughs> um, and, and here are some other activities that you can do to, to, to uh, engage your dog's mind for a week. Uh, and then let's, let's talk again next week. And let's revisit this. They will have had a week of reprieve. They will have had a week without that stress and they can start kind of liking their dog again so that your starting point when you are ready to address the behavior um, is a little bit calmer now. The, 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 the client is uh, in a better state of mind to listen to what it is that you have to say and will probably be more receptive to whatever program you want to um, initiate and present to them. That's what I mean by putting out the fire. Yeah, no, we just brought up a, a new chimney. <laughs> Uh, which is a, a Mexican word, I believe, <laughs> for our I've... garden. It's it's like a fire pit, but it's got like a big chimney on it. Oh, okay. So you can actually sit around yeah. fire and the flames are controlled. Um, and I'm just actually literally thinking about sitting in front of that chimney and when it gets so uncomfortably hot, you know, like it's – like you feel like you're in danger because it's so it's so hot and you have to like physically remove yourself. So that that metaphor is actually really resonating with me. You kind of thinking about when you're standing in front of an actual fire, how uncomfortable that is, and just 
removing yourself gives that instant gratification. Yeah, like it's, 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 it's the fire is so intense, like you can't like. That's all you can focus on. Yeah, and here's another analogy that I think people resonate with. Um, I, I often talk about using the stove fan. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? That you know, there's a low and a high setting on a stove fan. Um, and sometimes, you know, when somebody is cooking in the kitchen and they've got the stove fan on high and you're sitting, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm assuming that somebody else is doing the cooking and you're sitting at the table and you're trying to have a conversation or you're trying to watch television and something is irritating you and you don't, you don't really know what it is until somebody turns off the fan and you're like, ah. Oh, now I can hear again. I can follow this conversation or I can hear the TV better. You didn't realize how irritated you were by that loud whirring fan uh, sound until it got turned off and suddenly you feel relief. So that's what I think that we should do as behavior consultants. When we first walk in, when we went that first initial meeting with the person, don't worry about getting your full program in front of them. Just turn off the stove fan. Give them a solution that is at least uh, effective enough and temporary enough just to, just to give them reprieve, just to, to let them think straight for a few days and then present your program. So it's like going with a client who's like doesn't realize their shoes are too tight and then taking their shoes off and they're like, oh, my God. That's an excellent <laughs> analogy. That is an excellent analogy. Um. It came from way when I was younger. I used to smoke cigarettes. You admitted that on the podcast before, and but someone someone said it to me like smoking cigarettes is like um, wearing a really tight pair of shoes. I'm just alienating all of our cigarette smokers at the moment. I uh, used to smoke. I get I'm I get exactly where you're getting where you're going with this. Yeah, it's like putting on a pair of a tight pair of shoes just so you can take it off again when you have a cigarette and then you finish your cigarette, you put on that pair of shoes again. Does that make sense? Oh, how funny. No, that's not where I thought you were going. It does make sense, but that's not where I thought you were going. I was thinking about the time that I finally quit. Um, and, and that like suddenly, a pair of shoes. yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. So this is what breathing's like. This is what food tastes like. This is, I didn't know. I didn't know until I stopped, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I, I, I see your point too. Yeah. Anyway, rabbit hole climbed out and going on to number four. Uh, when we teach people, we have to give them some easy steps to do. You, you, you said <laughs> we have to take off our explaining pants. Explaining so, pants, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, did, we're, we're kind of recovering ground maybe, but I wonder if there's anything else you can build, uh, add to build on what you've said so far. Is there anything that you can say that can help us uh, <laughs> acknowledge yeah. and realize when we are wearing our explaining pants? Um, and, and it's explain me, Ex like smarty explain pants, uh, <laughs> smarty <laughs> pants, bossy pants, explainy pants. Yeah, it's um, uh, I think that we, <laughs> for most of the time we can tell when we've got our explainy pants on because our clients eyes were <laughs> they might glaze over <laughs> or they start, you know, their eyes are darting elsewhere. Now you see that they're looking at, at their watch or they're looking at, um, you know, other things in the environment is catching their attention. Um, or they're yawning. <laughs> These are really obvious signs, but I, <laughs> I think that, um, when I talk about giving them small steps, sometimes those small steps that you give them, they don't even have to be related to the issue that they called you for. Sometimes it's just a matter of giving them something that will at least give them the opportunity to experience some success. So uh, if, for example, I'm there for a barking issue, if I teach them how to teach their dog to target their hand with, with their nose, you know, it's a simple behavior and it, it gives them the opportunity to experience what it feels like to teach their dog a new behavior, to connect with them and, and to have some success and to feel good. Um, that's what I mean by starting with small steps that it doesn't even have to be related to the issue that they called you about, but you're giving them something, um, simple to learn something that they can use. Um, and it makes them feel good and it gives them, uh, not necessarily motivation, but enthusiasm to continue working with you because it feels good to work with you. Gives them some reinforcements it does. for working with you. And if it's not a problem for them, then it's not a problem for you. That was number five. So is it, is it kind of like we're going in there to figure out what the function of the uh, barking is for the dog, but 
you're saying let's figure out what the function of them asking us for help is as well. So you're you're wearing your behaviour analysis hats for all animals in the situation, not just them. That's exactly it. That's and it's you know I've never thought of putting it that way, and and you're exactly right. That's what it is. Finding out what the function of the client's behaviour is. Um, finding out why they think that 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 that's a problem. Why are they contacting you? Um, uh, you know, and on there's a there's a good enough dog Facebook page, and my cover photo is um is a is a Doberman just kind of lounging on the couch with the tagline, "If it's not a problem for you, it's not a problem." And, and I've actually had situations like that where clients have called me in for um, for problems that I I don't see, you know, there and. The, the dog is on the couch and they're like, well, see, there he goes again. You know, we keep taking him off and he keeps jumping up. And I'm like, well, can I ask why you don't want your dog on, on your couch? Like, well, because he's not supposed to be there, right? <laughs> and then you you realize, well, well, is it a problem for you? Do you mind, and, you know, or, or do you mind if your dog jumps up on the bed? It's like, no, actually, I, I don't mind, but I've heard that it could make him really aggressive. I'm like, no, you know what? That's That's not actually accurate. And if you don't mind your dog on your bed with you, and if it's not a problem for you, then there isn't a problem at all. And sometimes just having that conversation with them, again, even though you haven't done any training, you've just solved all kinds of issues for your client. And they're seeing their dog in a whole new light, which is fantastic. Mm, so we've got one more thing we want to talk about, but I'm going to make it too. <laughs> yes. So the, the list is the importance of listening to your clients. Don't be afraid to use management uh, band-aid solutions. Put out the fire. Uh, give people easy steps to do. Be split in a lumper and uh, figure out what the function of the client's behavior is. If it's not a problem for them, then it shouldn't necessarily be a problem for you. Um, and so the, if we're not doing this as well, because one thing that uh, is – at the front of my mind recently is burnout and compassion fatigue uh, in our profession. Uh, yeah, th- these sounds like tips to me to help us as well mm-hmm. be more okay with yeah. th- our expectations. Yep, and uh, certainly to um, decrease our frustration level. You know, and when we, uh, I think that that's where a lot of trainers begin to think that they like dogs more than they like people because they seem to be. Uh, better able to affect dogs' behaviors, but not people's behaviors, and they become very frustrated. Um, and they think that it's because the problem is with the people, because they're just not doing what I'm telling them to do. And I know how to solve this problem if only they would do what I'm telling them to do. <laughs> when really, if you kind of switch that around and think, well, um, maybe you weren't really listening to what the person was saying and what their needs were, because there is probably another solution to get there. Um, other than the solution that you have in mind. And I think that uh, lowering, not lowering, I th- uh, lowering is not a, the right word, adjusting our expectations um, is a surefire way to help prevent burnout because then we ex- experience more success as well. And then we can help more dogs. Yes. And the last thing you wanted to talk about today, which I think flows from everything we've talked about so far and, and something that you mentioned keeps resurfacing for you. And it kind of relates, I think, back to your point four there. Uh, and this is for both trainers and for for pet dog trainers and for uh, trainers who are training trainers. Uh, so is <laughs> the need the need to slow down more or, or your, your, your thoughts around... Uh, the offering that maybe we need to slow down more uh, and accept behavior change takes time or in other words, uh, slow down and trust the process, uh, which, which I think flows nicely from that compassion fatigue burnout talk as well. Can you, can you build on this idea for us, Nancy? Yeah, I think that um, many of us, whether we're trainers or not, when we're working with our dogs, we become, and I don't remember who coined this phrase first, where I first heard it, but we become greedy with behavior. You know, as we begin to train and we see that our dog is is giving us an inch and we take a mile and we push things just a little too far um, and, and we either uh, cause frustration or, uh, you know, the dog checks out. I think that it's more 
um, relative to situations when we're uh, dealing with fearful behaviors or, or aggression. You know, so some of the more severe cases that I've dealt with, but people tend to rush through and behavior change does take time. And we need to be very, very patient with that. And um, I, I think that this is more true for trainers than when we're working with clients, um, especially when I'm dealing with other trainers. This continues to happen, um, that we tend to rush the process. And, and an, uh, my favorite, analogy. And um, anyone who's heard me speak before has probably heard me talk about this a hundred times. My favorite analogy is that of um, the butterfly of the, the, uh, the author of Zorba the Greek, Nicholas Oh, I can never pronounce his name. And I know that I always preface this by saying I can never pronounce his name. And I'm not even going to try. The author of Zorba the Greek uh, talked about an incident when he was younger and he witnessed a butterfly uh, coming out of its cocoon. And he was watching it happen and he became impatient with the process. So he thought he would help it out. And so he started blowing very gently on the wings of the butterfly, hoping to, you know, to, to, to help dry them out fast enough so that the butterfly could fly. But that was a natural process that needed to unfold in a very specific way. And he tried to rush the process. And in doing so, he ruined it. And the butterfly died. And he said that he was racked with guilt for the rest of his life for having done that when really he should have just let it unfold as it was supposed to. So when I'm, when I'm teaching other trainers, especially, uh, and, uh, and I come across this topic where we need to trust the process and just take our time and not get greedy with behavior, I talk about this analogy and every now and then I'm just going to say to them, butterfly, just to let them know, hold on, I think you're pushing it just a little bit, you know, just slow down. You, you got the behavior that you wanted, just slow down and be happy with that until you move on to the next step. Don't get greedy. It's time to end the session, for example. Um, and to not expect change to happen too soon, because sometimes, uh, especially when we're dealing with processes like desensitization and counter conditioning, you just can't rush those things. They're going to happen when they happen. Um, and for some, for some dogs, it's going to happen a little bit faster than other dogs, depending on their reinforcement history uh, and all kinds of, of other um, variables, but it's going to happen when it's going to happen. Um, so I think that that's something that we need to remind each other and ourselves every now and then to, uh, to just slow down. And that when you're talking about um, compassion, fatigue, and frustration, with, with our work, that is something that if we keep reminding ourselves that there is a natural process and it's not under our control entirely, um, that can help us, I think, kind of let go and let things unfold as they should. Any, any tips on how we do this? <laughs> uh, well, um, think of butterflies. <laughs> Remind yourself every now and then, oh yeah, this is not under my control. There's nothing that I can do about this. So I need to just let it unfold as it should. I can contribute to it by manipulating the environment. Um, you know, um, I, as, as we do when, when we're working with uh, desensitization and, and counter conditioning, especially. And um, I think to remind each other too, as trainers, we communicate a lot with, you know, we usually have our own uh, group or circle of, of trainer friends that we share cases with that we look to for advice sometimes. And I think sometimes when somebody is asking specifically for some help with an issue, sometimes really all they need is to be reminded, hey, I think you're doing all right so far, you know, that I, I don't think that you can expect much more than what you are seeing as a result right now at this point. I think you're doing okay. So just, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing and you will probably see the results if you just take a step back and slow down. You're going to start seeing the results that, that you are expecting to see. Mm. And so when you say that other people in your network might be like, hey, you're doing okay, uh, <laughs> I was about to start the question with do you think, which means that I think and I'm wanting to, you to reassure me that I, my thoughts are on the right track. Um, <laughs> what I think is that uh, we sometimes forget to celebrate approximations along the way because we're so focused on the end goal. Is my thought process here, does it, firstly, does it make sense? Uh, secondly, is that kind of in line with what you're saying here? That maybe another thing we can do is just f f celebrate all of those little things that we're doing towards that end goal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, that That's a huge part of it. I think that another part of it, too, is um, is... 
we tend to think that everything is under our control. We tend to think that we are trainers and therefore we are manipulators of behavior. And we should be able to affect behavior when we want to affect behavior. We think that we should see results when we expect to see results. And we forget that this is a natural process. You know, we, we know that, um, we know that, that, it, it, this is a, behavior is a natural science, you know, that there are, um, there are, uh, looking for the English words, there are, you know, when we say behavior is lawful, um, we can't manipulate and control things as much as we would like to. And I think that when we, when we think of ourselves as trainers or behavior consultants, we think that we can have control over everything and we don't, <laughs> we just don't, that there is a natural process that, that we need to, um, to respect and appreciate. And so how you were saying that we need to, um, to celebrate these, uh, these small steps and accomplishments and, and approximations, well, that's part of appreciating and, and respecting the process. Do you say process or process? I say process. <laughs> I think. I think. <laughs> no, I don't even know. Um, celebrate approximations. Uh, thanks to Susan Freeman for combining those two awesome words in that little word sandwich. Um, sadly, that does that bring us to the final question for this episode. Uh, Phoebe's running around acknowledging that. She knows when the episode's about to finish. I, don't, I haven't figured out what it is yet. Um, and... and more and more I'm reaching this question where people kind of <laughs> think we've already answered the question throughout the podcast, but we're going to look into the future now because we started off this episode of where you got going. We've kind of talked about what you're doing now. For this part, I'd like you to take us into the future. Uh, build on everything you've said thus far. And it's just repeated if it's what you want to see moving forward. But what, what do you really want for our industry, uh, for animal trainers, uh, for the animal training world? What do you really want to see happen in the next five to ten years? Well, I'll tell you that where we are coming from, and I don't know if this is a cultural thing, but that this is, you know, I'll speak for my culture because this is true for my culture. Where we're coming from is that the family dog never used to receive any training. You know, the dogs that received training were working dogs. They were dogs that needed training to know specific behaviors. And the family dog, the pet dog, never received any training. And then there came this boom where training became very popular, you know, training the family dog and um, not just doing activities. Not, I'm not talking about this, the sport dog or the working dog. I'm talking about the family dog. There came this boom where we started to do a lot of training and manipulating. And I would even say going so far as micromanaging all social interactions and, and practically all behaviors. Um, you know, we went, the, 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 the pendulum really swung from one end to the other, from zero training to micromanaging social interactions and behaviors. What I would like to see now, and I think that we're actually headed this way. What I would like to see is for the pendulum to just kind of return to center now, where um, where where we know more about behavior and we know more about training, um, but we're no longer micromanaging, where we are now finally going to be comfortable with allowing dogs to be dogs <laughs> and where our training uh, will come in handy so that we can live more harmoniously. You know, we there are urban laws, there are... Um, you know, th certain rules and regulations that we need to respect and, and that uh, we can use training to help dogs live within this, this human community with laws and regulations, but without stopping them from being dogs, you know, to start celebrating, um, to me celebrating because I love dogs, but to start being okay with things like a dog barking now and then in a yard, <laughs> you know, it happens. Dogs bark. <laughs> it's, it's just what dogs do. And, and to be okay with, um, a lot of natural dog behaviors that we are currently very, very obsessed with micromanaging. So I think that I'd like to see the pendulum swing a little bit more center and to pair this, this new training knowledge that we have with um, appreciating dogs for who they are and what they are, because they're marvelous, aren't they? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, and, and all animals as well, cats, mm -hmm. horses, uh, exotics, whatever you're working with. Sure. Hey, thanks again so much for sharing everything today, Nancy. Uh, just before we do officially wrap up, 
we did mention this towards the start of the episode, but can you just remind everyone listening uh, where they can go to find out more about you, uh, what you do, and get in touch? Yep. Uh, my website is nancytucker.com. And um, and again, I'm an instructor for Fenzy Dog Sports Academy. So any classes that I teach for, for Fenzy uh, will be listed on the um the Fenzy website, which I, I, I'm actually not sure if it's, I think it's Fenzy Dog Sports Academy dot com. <laughs> and to, uh, to look out for the good enough dog. Cool. Well, will link to all of that in the uh, show note and look very much looking forward to uh, your book coming out. Uh, and we'll link to everything I've already just said this am I repeating myself I can't even remember what happened 10 seconds ago what's happening to me Nancy (laughs) we'll link to all of this in the show notes if I've said that twice then repetition is the master of all skill don't know if that saying applies here but we'll go with it this has been so much fun Nancy from myself uh, from Phoebe Dog sitting next to me from everyone listening uh, and to all of the dogs animals and humans that are going to feel the ripples of this episode we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today it's very appreciated thank you so much it's been my pleasure thank you so much for having me of course everyone listening out there as well we appreciate you tuning in today and if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive funnish choice rich ways and as mentioned at the start of the episode the animal training academy community is waiting for you head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the netflix social media platform for behavior nerds there's something there for absolutely everyone we're looking forward to having you join the tribe that's it for this episode though we're going to wrap it up there thanks again so much everyone for listening you'll hear from us again soon